Hi everyone, it's Chris Wallace here from uh, SEO 2023. Really happy to be joined by uh, Monty Paul from City of Hope, uh, who's presenting at today's meeting um, on the role of the microbiome and uh, response in kidney cancer patients. So thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So, you know, this is work I think you guys have been doing for quite some time. and. To some degree, it feels kind of intuitive that when you know we're moving to a, a therapeutic landscape that really leverages the immune system, that other notions of you know aspects of physiology that affect immune response in in the host may be important. Uh, and I sort of harken back, I guess, to the studies looking at um, using antibiotics uh, and patients receiving a TISO and that affecting their response. And you know what what sort of laid the groundwork for the big program I think you you've built now. Well, I, I think as with many things, it was really relying on technological discoveries. You know, I think the ability to really sequence the microbiome and understand gut composition has really transformed things for us. So we've gotten to the point now, beyond our initial studies a decade ago almost, to really be able to hone in and identify those specific bacteria that are associated with response or non-response. And of course, that's led to a lot of hypotheses around treatment as well. Absolutely. And so, you know, I think all of us were really impressed when you came out with the phase one data and really showing how in we can uh, potentiate the effect of things that already appear to be uh, guideline recommended treatments for, for our RCC patients. And so you've been looking at, you know, multiple ways, supplementation and, and other factors. And maybe you can walk us through how you approach ways to mediate the, the biome in, in our patients. Yeah, well, this is a really interesting story. And I have to give a lot of credit to my colleagues at City of Hope, many of whom were involved and some of the agents that I've been working with. Um, the agent that we've probably offered the most focus to is called CBM588. And in fact, this is something that you can buy really off the shelf in Japan. It's been used for decades there uh, as a supplement for general GI ailments. But CBM is actually an interesting compound. It's Clostridium butyricum, and it's a specific strain where when ingested, a spore enters into the lower intestines and then starts releasing butyrate. And we hypothesize that that's what really sort of drives the proliferation of favorable bacteria, ones that will help enhance the immunotherapy response. So um, as you'd mentioned, we've done two studies now. The first looking at nivolumab and nipilimumab, standard frontline therapy for metastatic renal cell. Uh, one of my fellows published that uh, last year in Nature Medicine. And we showed some really compelling signals to suggest that you can augment the impact of Nevo Ipi with CBM. We actually have a second study that we just presented at ASCO this year. One of my fellows uh, had that presentation as well, looking at Cabo Nevo with CBM588, showing a similar effect. So I think this has legs. Um, and actually, the studies are going to migrate into a more definitive randomized trial through SWOG. Uh, Pedro Barada from Case Western is going to be running that. Absolutely, and so this is um, supplementation, but there's other ways that we can assess the or or affect the microbiome. You're talking about transplantation, and maybe give us a clue how that fits into you know the uh, armamentarium moving forward. Yeah, well, I think it ranges from the seemingly complex to the seemingly simple. Um, and I'll tell you why I use the term seemingly in just a moment here. But fecal microbiome transplant is something that the melanoma community has looked at pretty extensively. And now there are several trials, some that use uh, stool that's collected from patients who have responded exceptionally well to therapy, some that actually use stool from healthy donors, in fact. Um, and we've found that transplantation can actually reinvigorate the immune response. So there's patients who have progressed, frankly, on front line immunotherapy who can have their responses restored through fecal microbiome transplant. I mean, to me, that's fascinating. So that's the seemingly complex element. The seemingly simple element is diet. And I actually think that dietary changes are incredibly challenging to manifest. I mean, you know, we think about how we counsel our patients in clinic and adherence and so forth. I, I find that it tends to be quite low. Having said that, there's some initial suggestions that fiber content may influence the outcome with immunotherapy. Um, I think that MD Anderson's really led the way with a lot of these studies. They've really put together these really interesting um, pathways for patients to take formulations of, of food throughout the course of the day for limited periods of time that incorporate mega amounts of fiber. So studies at MD Anderson are ongoing and may really inform this fiber hypothesis. So, you know, if we're looking maybe three or five years from now, how do you see the standard of care? How does microbiome sort of mediation fit into the standard of care that we're going to expect moving forward? 
Well, you know, I think that immunotherapy, frankly, which is what we're using as a backbone for these microbiome treatments, is a great paradigm. You, know, you think back to when we were in medical school hearing about interleukin-2 and interferon, or at least when I was in medical school, you're a lot younger than me. Um, but, you know, at that point in time, in that really nascent phase, I don't think that people were blown away by the responses that we're seeing. But, of course, that was that initial sort of nonspecific iteration. I think over time, the microbiome field is going to get more and more sophisticated to the point that we can really hone in on specific gastrointestinal pathways that are going to drive response. I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think we're steadily moving in the right direction. And, and in GU, we focus a lot in the kidney space here, but we're also using a lot of immunotherapy in bladder. Is this a, you know, uh, an avenue? You know, I would say that Laura Bukovina, uh, who I believe is, uh, in fact, now a case, uh, is doing a really terrific job in characterizing the bladder microbiome. And she's done this in the context of urinary specimens and fecal specimens. Uh, some of her studies have uh, shown that the microbiome can potentially predict non-response neoadjuvant chemotherapy. She has an interesting paper that she published earlier this year that actually looks at uh, the ability to detect bladder cancer. Um, and so I think that these initial forays can potentially help us move towards a therapeutic strategy. Um, but all this discovery work that she's doing, I think, is laying, uh, really laying a great framework for that work. Absolutely. And so, you know, if we look to the next steps, what, what do we need to learn as a community to make uh, microbiome sort of manipulation part of our, our standard care pathways? I think we need to see some more compelling signals. I think that what our group has produced with CBM is one such signal, but if there are others from other groups, from other geographic territories, really suggesting that microbiome manipulation works, and I think we have that, you know, that's really going to lead to the snowball effect in the field. In the same way that we've seen immunotherapy sort of cascade over the years into so many different options, I'm hoping that the same will be true for the microbiome. Absolutely. Well, just want to thank you for your time, and uh, I really appreciate you uh, joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me.